Hey, Cyberspace, Nathan Wallace coming at you uh, from Orlando, Florida. Today is March uh, 18th, 2019. I'm actually here at the uh, SANS uh, ICS Security Summit. Uh, you know, definitely apologies. Uh, I think it's been a couple months now since I uh, last posted one of these videos. Um, you know, uh, basically just got really bogged down on the home front and the work front. And of course, those two kind of things you know, <laughs> take, uh, take top priority. Uh, but hopefully I can, you know, find a routine with these videos again, um, and we can get things going. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, got a lot of good feedback to date. Uh, so yeah, hopefully, hopefully we can keep this going. Uh, I guess the first thing I wanted to pull up was, uh, the PG&E, uh, you know, filed for, uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy. This is actually an article back from January, um, by the uh, electric light and power and basically it was just general you know of course want to make sure everyone's aware of the the fact you know this is a utility uh, a monopoly uh declaring bankruptcy you know so the, it, it's interesting as far as the legality of that you know how things uh, uh the requirements right as far as a monopoly declaring bankruptcy uh, so yeah it's a local utility right so it's a, a local monopoly um you know, so it's they they went down this route before, right? PG&E declared bankruptcy a couple of years ago, um, and basically, what does it mean? What what's the real requirements? Uh, you know, and in the specific case of some of these fires and, and the utility they're being held count accountable for that uh, and liable for that is, um, you know, really what does that mean? And I think you know some news uh, since even this article came out came out in late January. Uh, was with regards to the liability and, and the court order as far as saying, all right, well, now in the 2019 fire season, uh, if the utility is, is currently in a state of bankruptcy, uh, well, you know, how does that really play out? Uh, and this is, you know, I got to hand it to the lawyers. I mean, I, give me give me engineering calculations any day. Uh, and <laughs> I'd rather do that than, than some of those legal stuff. Uh, something else, uh, Nehruk published uh, this really great resource, it's free, free resource, uh, 71 pages here, Consumers and Catastrophes, Understanding the Impacts to You, Your Family, and Your Utilities. Uh, so this is kind of focused on some of the natural disasters. Um, most of this kind of seemed weather related. Um, uh, for instance, uh, earthquake, uh, let's see, hurricane, landslide, tornado, volcano, wildfire. Um, but well, cold wave, ice storm, drought, earthquake, yeah. But you know, some of these, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly how an explosion, let's say, is is uh, a natural disaster, even a chemical spill and gas leak, and you know, how do you, how do you? Uh, it's, it's. This is a really good document. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, to say the document, but you know, there are other, other events, you know, that would be. Uh, potentially beneficial to add and, and just kind of help explaining it to to the uh, consumer right of, of some of the utilities for instance you know the cyber stuff or uh, or even you know the electromagnetic stuff but of course people are still trying to wrap their head uh, around the electromagnetic stuff uh, the Venezuela power outage uh, this actually happened last week uh, absolutely you know devastating sad uh, it's real personal uh, you know got somewhat emotional you know when i saw the uh the uh, uh newborn intensive care unit the neonatal intensive care unit uh videos coming out of that you know and uh, with a newborn myself i mean it was just it was just, uh devastating watching i mean i was cringing and i actually had to turn it off uh, just because uh you know without power power uh you know it's at the heart of everything now and they were talking about you know some of the uh, plants there, the factories, uh, like the steel refineries, and uh, the whole industries are just destroyed now because because of the power uh, outage. But you know, I actually did an interview here for Wired magazine. Uh, it was really cool. You know, there's a couple of engineers as me, uh, Tim Yardley, and um, uh, Michael as well. So. It's really cool. All three of us are, you know, electrical engineers, electrical engineering background, and, and we also focus now on, on cybersecurity. And, and she interviewed all three of us for this article and talking about, you know, why is it so hard to really restart um, uh, the entire system? Uh, and specifically for one of these generation plants, you know, it's called a Black Start Generation. Uh, what, what is really involved in the challenges and the difficulties of bringing all this back online? So it's really neat, you know, uh, being interviewed alongside three three actual industry engineers and, st and having this industry perspective presented uh and often it's it's not presented right 
Um, and I even think there are a couple of cybersecurity people who, who are uh, focused on ransomware even interviewed uh, as a result, you know, <laughs> because the hype at the beginning of this outage was that it was a, a cyber attack. Uh, and I think uh, they even pointed uh, the finger at the United States. Um, but, but honestly, with, re with regards to this particular event, uh, it's a power system, it's power grid, there's, there's a lot of system uh, grid level um, optimization reliability issues uh, that I think facilitated even some of the outage issues. Uh, for instance, you know, damn, 80% of the power generation a uh, single 765 KV line feeding a single uh, substation that serviced, I believe, like six out of the eight major cities in Venezuela. So, you know, this this is really, I think, a modern example, uh, an example that we can point to today that really provides motivation for why we need to push forward towards this smart grid. Uh, you know, where power, uh, we have distributed power. Uh, generation, you know, that's, that's what we call DERS, uh, distributed energy resources. Uh, so th this particular example offers, uh, as tragic as it was, you know, I'm definitely not, not, you know, trying to pass over how tragic this event was and and really the impact to the civilian population. Um, devastating, right? I think uh, multiple deaths already just, just from the uh, hospitals not keeping the uh, ICU up and running. Um, you know, AC heat. <laughs> I mean, the the uh, it's it's really devastating, right? For multiple industries, whenever the power goes out, uh, uh, people die. You know, people die. Um, you know, so so looking at this and saying, all right, well, well, what's the key issue? What happened? Um, and then how do we prevent this from happening in the future? And and as an engineer, it's it's you know, I'm always thinking, okay, well, how do we design these systems? Uh, where they are resilient, you know, we, we throw that term around so much, and, and I think there's it's not really an appreciation for what it really means from the engineering perspective. Uh, but the smart grid can facilitate some of that resiliency. Uh, we just have to get there, and I think this this offers uh, an opportunity to have those lessons learned uh, to to help push push us forward. Uh, it doesn't matter what country you are. Um, for everyone so kind of shifting gears so that was general I know only you know three three main bullet points but I was still trying to keep this short so yeah NERC uh, this actually happened earlier this year uh, NERC issues the record-breaking 10 million dollar fine I think the previous record holder was 2.7 uh, million uh, some reports came out and said that this was Duke um, but what's what's interesting is the length of this um, so you see pretty much SIP002, so these, this column here represents all the violations. So SIP002, we have high, low, medium, so all across the range. And look at this, 002, 003, 004, 005, uh, 6, 7, keep on cruising, 9, 10. Uh, I mean, just all of this, right? All of this. Uh, the notice of penalty which is what's published to NERC's website, you know, kind of outlining some of the violations. It is multiple pages here. So we have a part one, a part two, a part three, and a part four. Uh, and I actually have all of the this downloaded and I went through it a couple, you know, a month and a half ago and then just got bogged down with other stuff. A lot of this is redacted. Um, but, you know, I was reading through it and, and some good stuff, some bad stuff. I actually talked about this uh, when I taught the class, uh, co-presented co co the uh, distribution cybersecurity class at Distributech uh, earlier this year and uh, used this as kind of some of the, uh, really some of the cultural things that are going on. And, and if you read it, and I'll, I'll, I should have time to come back and do a, an extensive review of this, uh, of this um, notice of penalty, but just wanted to make sure you're aware of that, you know, 10, 10 million is, is a lot of money. Um, so the other thing, uh, Senate passes this uh, Securing Energy Act. Um, I'm not sure where this sits now, but let me sit out of some of this stuff. Uh, and basically the argument here is, you know, oh, well, we're so concerned about cyber. Let's keep the grid dumb to protect it from cyber. You know, and that's that's the, the twist that the media is really running with in presenting this uh, this proposed legislation or bill that's, that's going to provide funding uh, to research some of this stuff. Uh, so yeah, Securing Energy Act, um, 
Let's see, keep on cruising, keep on cruising. This is it right here. I wanted to link it. Uh, so they, you know, of course, talking about the industrial control systems. Um, let's see, talks about, you know, it's just defining some of the general terms. Um, so here, here's one of the articles, for instance. Uh, also have this linked here. Uh, analog grid um, backup uh, bill passes the Senate. So if you're not familiar with, with the way power systems work, the power grid generation, uh, in a lot of cases we have what's called mimic panels and you know you can go up and you know, just, you know and what that is is uh, if you go up to a relay panel, you know, in some cases you just go up to the relay, open breaker, close breaker, right? You can do that via the HMI on the breaker. Uh, the SCADA operators can do that from their control center, um, you know, via the HMI, the human machine interface. But then if you're locally in the control house, like I said, you can either go up to the relay or you can go up to the mimic panel, which is typically, you know, right under the relay panels uh, or relays and then just go, you know, and what it does is it's a, it's a contact that's in line with the, 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 uh, the circuit for the, uh, the trip coil of the breaker, right? So, I mean, this is just fundamental <laughs> protection, uh, best practices. There's always that manual backup. Um, even outside of the relay protection to open and close uh, a breaker, right? So <laughs> I'm not sure how much of this is really going to benefit the industry. Uh, I mean, so you can take a look at this and, and really give it a deep dive. Uh, and then hopefully, hopefully, like I said, you know, I can come back as well and, and give this a, a deep dive uh, review. Um, and I know that it's proposing funding to kind of do some stuff um basically assessing and reviewing where we can keep things manual uh, but you know if you look at the overall uh, encompass and I think some some of other media outlets were really talking about okay let's just keep it dumb that way we can protect it against cyber risks right cyber threats but if we look at the the overall system and the risks and what risk really means and is the fires in California perfect example uh, the Northeast blackout, uh, the outage in Queens a couple of years ago, as far as the distribution transformers, uh, you know, reaching kind of above rated voltage and, and power. And then all of a sudden, it was almost a little cascade outage uh, lasted, I think, a week there uh, in Queens, New York. Um, it was a lack of technology. It was a lack of visualization into those systems. Even if we look at the, um, the Venezuela uh, power outage last week. It's a lack of visualization. Um, we talk about the resiliency of the smart grid. We need this technology. We need to push things forward. It's just we have to do it securely. Um, uh, we have to engineer it with security. Uh, here's another article. Uh, do, 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 do. Utility dive. I always love their stuff. It's a good, good, good resource. Uh, nation states organized crime and angry employees threaten utility cybersecurity. Um, so I forget the exact main point, but uh, I typically like just kind of sharing these, bring bring people's attention to it. Uh, like I said, this is done by Deloitte. So that's a big thing. I think I just wanted to, to kind of bring your uh, bring this to your attention. Uh, let's see. Here's another one. New York Utilities proposed cybersecurity protocols for third parties. Uh, great proposal or great uh, idea, <laughs> I guess, you know, try to help solve some of the supply chain stuff. Um, not sure how, um, uh, what could really happen, uh, but I think it's, it is in, it is an attempt to, you know, definitely from the utility standpoint, to kind of push that liability uh, uh, over to the supply chain. Um, so yeah, it was basically to the uh, Public Service Commission, uh, discussing some of the requirements and I can see where a lot of this is is really applicable for some of that smart grid technology uh, you know where let's say you know if it's a, a smart meter a lot of behind the meter type technology and they're using third-party third-party applications third-party software uh, and in some cases in the cloud right uh, to do that data analytics to do that billing for instance um, you know so what what on paper or, or legality uh, can they seek that basically says, all right, these are the requirements, this is the stand, uh, policy standards on, on security, for instance, 
um, that you have to comply with or some kind of minimum requirement or, or liability stuff or sign off on something. I don't know, <laughs> but this is where the lawyers have fun. Uh, let's see. Utility dive. It's time to change our grid. Um, like I said, another utility dive article. This was published actually today. Yeah, that's right. I added this. Um, I, I did skim this and basically, you know, a couple. So what we need to do, right? So this is that, that summary. Um, so let's see, this threat will not go away, relying on physical defensive techniques, software patching, anti-malware tools, creating strong perimeters and air gap networks will not uh, will not be enough to ward, to ward off future attacks. Um, you know, so right, we talk about FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Uh, I mean, I know, for instance, um, you know, this is hard enough, right? <laughs> For, for some utilities and asset owners, you know, this is hard enough, uh, honestly, in, in an OT system to, to do patching, right? I mean, to have anti-malware tools running in your OT enterprise, in your protection, SCADA environment, control system environment, and, and now we're saying, okay, well, we have to do all of this other stuff. But, you know, some of this is, is a little trivial. Uh, for instance, work with standard bodies such as NIST, and honestly, SunSpec, I've never heard of them until I read this article. Uh, and as far as I know, they're not really a standards body. Um, you know, so NIST is a standards body. Uh, NERC is a standards body. IEEE, IEC, to me, those are the standards bodies. I'm not sure um, SunSpec's uh, role, I guess, in securing um, electric utilities, at least as a whole. Uh, let's see, engage regulators, da, 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 da. Uh, I think some of this, there a lot of asset owners are already doing. Um, but what what, I re what stood out is, is we're, once again, it's not calling out the fact that we need to engineer these systems with security, um, you know, inside the power plant, inside the substation, on the feeder circuit. You know, a lot of this, this stuff that's being discussed in these articles is, is a lot of it's focused on the enterprise environment and what you should be doing and honestly it doesn't even really look at the operational side um let's see another thing is this is an article doe cyber arm preps risk management tool uh so i think this is the group there within the department of energy let's see continue this side yes um yeah, so the, the, the really cool acronym, right? Departments of Energy's Office for Cybersecurity, Energy Security, Emergency Response. Um, CISER basically talking about a new tool that they're trying to develop that uh, helps asset owners kind of quantify the, the investment of cybersecurity uh, to see, okay, well, what's the return? Um, and and honestly, the w the way the tool is described in this article, you know this this title, and I think the way um, Evans even presents it is is like this um, cyber risk management, um, and it doesn't seem like based on the description, and of course this is just my opinion, uh, but it seems like a, just a cyber risk estimate tool, right? It allows you to estimate, uh, but as far as the management, the management is, is really operational um, helping you to manage in in real time and and uh, understand the true risk right um, and and that takes a broad broad range of expertise you know definitely the protection engineers the automation engineers back office at t compliance you know you have all these different risk factors safety uh, so I'm, I'm really curious to see this this formula that they're talking about calculating and I think um, it's probably going to be really, really beneficial, you know, uh, once once it's out there and, and hopefully made public as far as how, how they're quantifying some of that. Uh, this is long, long overdue. Uh, so back in 2017, uh, IEEE Smart Grid held a, the cybersecurity workshop. Uh, I was actually on that committee, uh, presented at this event. Uh, it was a great event. It's coming back this year, 2019. Um, actually, the program... Uh, committee chair for for this uh, 2019 workshop. The white paper is published officially, finally in the resource center. Uh, went through a couple couple revisions there, um, and I can show y'all the summary of it if I can ever bring it up. Uh, let's see. So this is it right here. Uh, like I said, available for download in the uh, IEEE Smart Grid Resource Center. 
Uh, so this was the workshop held back in 2017. There's a couple of the other contributors that were on this uh, committee, basically helping to organize this. Um, doo -doo -doo. Let me just hop on over to the executive summary. So yeah, the introduction. So we, we basically looked at these six different uh, tracks or sessions. So we had the overview of the security situation risk, uh, cybersecurity best practices, uh, so, you know, there's a lot of events that, that kind of talk about best practices, uh, but it's honestly how it's, it's interesting how some don't reference even NIST. They don't reference IEC. They don't reference IEEE. Uh, when you talk about best practices, it, it, those are things you should reference, right? Uh, physical security and supply chain, uh, security conscious software development. You know, so these two are huge uh, policy issues and then academic research. So this uh, we had these different sessions, multiple presenters, multiple perspectives, uh, and this white paper kind of provides a summary of it. You know, it's 29, uh, right under 30 pages. Uh, there's the, the executive summary, the different sessions. So I'm going to uh, skim over that. Uh, so here are things that kind of jumped out. Once again, this is just the executive summary. So this is actually published, uh, freely available. I think Packworld um, is going to have a uh, article that kind of outlines some of this as well. But, you know, these are things that, that really jumped out at me that, that I wanted to share. So uh, both regulatory and technical industry standards can be used to help organizations create a comprehensive framework to secure the power grid, right? So when we talk about standards, we typically, a lot of people just jump to the policy standards, um, you know, focused on NERC SIP, right? That has nothing to do with the technical aspects, uh, has nothing to do, honestly, with implementation. Um, I actually have a colleague, you know, he, he frames it really nicely in the context when he says, uh, you know, NERC SIP is, is really, you know, what you need to, what you need to protect. And then the IEEE and IEC standards and even some of the NIST standards talk about how to do that, right? How to protect. Um, so it's really, you know, it's really good when you can kind of see the difference between the industry technical as well as the, uh, the policy and regulatory standards. Uh, a challenge, however, is understanding which ones to apply in which situation. Uh, there was actually the gentleman that stood up, you know, and said, oh, there's so many standards out there. Uh, you know, I don't even know where to start. And, and it is a problem. And, and there is a group within IEEE, honestly, that's trying to look at that uh, to help to help close that gap. Um, here's another one. Uh, resilient on the topic of resiliency, right? Uh, a resilient smart grid is one that can bend without breaking and is the result of engineered solutions that respond to cyber events automatically. Uh, that's huge. Uh, that's actually being talked about here at SANS as far as machine-to-machine uh, -machine threat response. Uh, there was a presentation today on that. Uh, it was a great presentation. Uh, but that's where we have to get to, right? If we're really going to, to say things are resilient, uh, things have to be engineered, right? It has to be built in. Uh, let's see. Cyber risk management should start with the board level, uh, you know, that offer guidance on risk tolerance, right? How much risk are they willing to accept? Um, but then that requires really that that tool, even that, that you know, Evans mentioned in the article that, that I just showed up, uh, that, that you have to understand the risk, right? Uh, and to me, that, that honestly takes the SCADA engineer, the protection engineer, the automation engineer, the power system OT expert to say, you know, in the case of power systems, the power grid, you know, if worst comes to worst, what can really happen? You know, not, not just to the lights turning out, the lost revenue from not being able to generate power, but also that, that, that third component and, the, and, you know, the safety issue. Uh, let's see. Systems can achieve the greatest uh, effectiveness by building cybersecurity into the systems from the ground up. And, you know, absolutely. We always hear this axiom as far as, um, you know, we need to build it in versus bolt it on. But we, we don't talk about how to do that, how to achieve it, and how to achieve that level of professionalism that the engineering community uh, and industries, um, you know, from civil building bridges to <laughs> building the power grid, you know, these, these defined engineering professionalism, uh, how do we achieve that now with, with the cyber challenge? We don't, we don't have that conversation uh, typically, and, and I think we're, that's something we need to start having. Uh, determine who has ownership and responsibility of power system cybersecurity and where that line draws is vital. You know, we, we talk about um, all the different silos uh, for some of these organizations and, um, you know, where, who has cybersecurity. Typically, it's the back office IT um, or, let's say, um, 
uh, the, the communications um, group, you know, that's just really focused on, you know, to the substation. Now, um, you know, what about inside the substation? What about the physical access or cyber remote access and logging who who's doing what, when, how, where? Um, you know, well, if that's outside the jurisdiction of, let's say, the people who are engineering the substation, those events and alarms, they're not going to be added. Um, it's not going to be spec'd, it's not going to be scoped, it's not going to be added. Uh, so therefore, we need to really deter determine who has ownership and responsibility. Uh, and then is there better opportunity, I guess, to kind of mesh those silos? Uh, let's see. Uh, there are multiple important issues requiring attention regarding ownership and responsibility of cybersecurity. Uh, most significantly, it's essential to break down the silos of IT and OT, right? Uh, let's see what else. Uh, this is something, you know, kind of looking towards the future here. Uh, you know, there's there are a number, you know, a lot of federal funded research dollars have went into multiple universities, uh, you know, that were basically looking at the physics of the system to try to derive a cyber conclusion, right? So that's what this, this last paragraph is kind of talking about. Uh, so new cybersecurity protection paradigms have been proposed that examine the physics of the power system application to derive a cyber inclusion. Uh, asset owners that place the responsibility of securing power systems solely on the back office IT department will have greater levels of difficulty in implementing these future technologies and solutions, right? Absolutely true. Um, a lot of great technology, a lot of great uh, research, and, you know, algorithms, sci real science uh, that's being done to look at these systems as cyber physical systems, highly coupled, um, and are able to detect uh, cyber attacks, intrusions, and, and really keep the system resilient and up and running, even in the midst of these attacks. Um, but to do that, you know, that takes a massive amount of power system engineering expertise. Um, not that that's a bad thing, but, you know, if we're having this cybersecurity conversation, even from the general industrial control system perspective, as well as just this IT perspective, or even just the compliance perspective, we're missing this whole component here, uh, where the objective is to keep the lights on. Um, you know, and, and these future solutions, these solutions that are being researched, developed, um, you know, by tax debt payer dollars, um, they're, they're never going to be utilized if we don't include or kind of shift that responsibility, uh, to the, to the power system engineer. Uh, so that, that was one of the other conclusions of this, uh, of this workshop. Uh, so that was the executive summary. You know, it's in the, this, this white paper is in the resource center. Uh, definitely, you know, download it. Uh, it's a great tool. And, and once again, this is going to be, uh, back in, um, uh, it's coming back this year. Uh, 2019, uh, real excited for it. We're going to have, uh, uh, this is going to be a two day event. Um, it's going to be uh, hosted, um, kind of a co-hosted event there with, uh, in a uh, NERC in Atlanta, uh, in, uh, about early to mid December. Uh, so I'm going to have more on that later, but, uh, as far as conferences, some of the recent ones, uh, back in January, of course, the, uh, IEEE PES joint technical committee meeting. So, uh, pretty much all the technical committee uh, committees within the IEEE Power and Energy Society. So these are the guys that make the standards as far as relay protection. Uh, DMP3, for instance, falls under this group, um, as well as a lot of other, other um, uh, even the cybersecurity stuff, the substation committee. Uh, let's see. Uh, you can go to this website. I have it linked here. Uh, you can basically look at the agenda, look at all the meetings. It was actually, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of engineers all in one place. It was really cool. Uh, and I've attended this a couple years now. And it's it's great just sometimes walking into the room and and then just listening to, to everyone trying to uh, create these new standards. And, of course, you know, these are vendors. These are consulting firms. These are the actual asset owners. Uh, so it was really cool seeing the community come together. And, and honestly, this, this community here has existed uh, for like 30, 40 years almost, uh, going on. Right. And so there, these standards date back, uh, several, several decades, even, uh, S4, uh, that was also back, uh, back in January there, um, the same week actually. Uh, so that was really interesting traveling, uh, for me, but I presented at S4. You can check out the presentation here. Welcome any feedback. Uh, and then here I'm actually talking about, you know, some of the standards that, that I'm working on within, uh, IEEE.
Uh, Distributech taught that class, uh, Distribution and Cybersecurity, SANS, that's this week. I'm actually presenting tomorrow uh, with Brian. Uh, a couple of future things that I've seen that, that really stood out. Uh, DOE Cyber Conference, of course, the UTC Telecom Technology Conference, uh, IEEE PS General Meeting. I'm, I'm teaching the Transmission Distribution and Cybersecurity class with that. Uh, Co-teaching with uh, Steve Koontzman and uh, Dr. Murdy Yala from uh, Beckwith. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we have the IEEE Smart Grid Cybersecurity Workshop coming up again in December. Uh, so hopefully that wasn't too long. I know it's been a couple months, like I said, since uh, last uh, was able to record one of these. Hopefully I can find the rhythm again, find the groove, and keep these going. But, yeah, feel free to uh, uh, reach out if you have any questions, comments. Uh, and if you like what you see, subscribe below. All right, thanks.